who won the space race? Most people would say the United States. And if one takes a space race in its totality, that would be true. After all, they landed on the moon. But what many don't know is that the Soviets actually had a commanding lead up until the moon landing. It might have beat the US to the moon if it wasn't for the untimely death of one man. Sergei Korolev. The namesake for the iconic Korolev Cross was not only considered by many to be the father of the Soviet space program, but also was in many ways the reason NASA exists as well. He was a driven man whose vision for the future forced the United States to play catch up throughout most of the space race. In 1966, however, Korolev died, and that fact blunted all future Soviet space travel. He was the singular visionary who ran the program, and when he died, the snake had lost its head. Had he survived even three more years, there was a much higher probability that the Soviets would have reached the moon first. The Soviet space program has its roots in a source extremely familiar to NASA, Nazi technology, specifically the V-2 rocket. Korolev was one of the first Soviet scientists to go study the V-2 in 1945. He was then later part of the team that designed the R-1 rocket, which although Soviet built was an exact copy of the German V-2. The experience proved to be invaluable, and Korolev and his team continued to iterate on the R-1, ultimately developing the final word in Soviet spaceflight, the R-7. The R-7 was unique in that it was the first ever intercontinental ballistic missile, or ICBM. ICBMs are massive rocket boosters with the primary purpose of delivering nuclear payloads to targets at extreme ranges. In this case, the ICBMs were designed to hit America itself, as opposed to previous short-range and intermediate-range missiles, which were designed to hit the closer NATO targets. Although the R-7 was supposed to be used for military purposes, Korolev had greater plans for the rockets. As Korolev, pointing at the ceiling, once said to a fellow engineer, the purpose of this rocket is to get up there. It's not some military toy. Very early on, he started lobbying for the R-7 to be used as a transportation method for satellites. That was one of Korolev's defining factors. He was always thinking ahead to how the current project should be used to advance space exploration. Korolev had the basic idea for Sputnik years before the satellite's launch. In 1954, he sent his first report on the feasibility of using the R-7 rocket for orbiting a satellite. Unfortunately for Korolev, requesting military technology for untested scientific endeavors was not popular with the Soviet higher-ups. Korolev was persistent, however, and eventually ensured that his reports reached the ears of those in power, which earned him modest funding for a potential satellite between 1954 and 1957. In 1955, Korolev and his colleague Mikhail Tikhonarov sent multiple reports and papers to various Soviet institutions to try and drum up more support for the project. The event that galvanized the Soviet leadership into supporting Korolev was U.S. President Dwight D. Eisenhower's announcement of a plan to send an American satellite into orbit by the end of 1958. Suddenly, Korolev's scientific project was a matter of national importance and dignity. To allow the Americans to put up a satellite first would be an embarrassment. Luckily for them, Korolev and his team had already completed a significant portion of the work. The initial plan was to launch a complex satellite loaded with scientific instruments. This satellite went under the name Object D. As time went on, though, it became clear that the development of Object D was proceeding more slowly than anticipated. If the Soviets were going to beat the US, then they would need to make the satellite less complex. Based on the advice of Tiranov, Korolev decided to push back Object D, and instead launch two significantly simpler satellites before Object D was ready. These satellites would end up being Sputnik 1 and 2. Sputnik 1 was about as simple as a satellite can be. It was little more than an aluminum sphere with two battery-powered radios on the inside. The radios were there so the Soviets could track the satellites, and consequently anyone with an even amateur radio experience could listen to the satellite beeps. Sputnik's final design ended up only weighing 83.6 kilograms, with more than half of its mass taken up by batteries in order to power the radio for two to three weeks. The development for this new, simpler satellite was finished in only a couple of months, and thus Sputnik 1 was ready and was launched on the 4th of October 1957 on the R-7-derived booster of the same name. With that launch, the Soviets reached the first milestone in the space race, the first artificial satellite. Sputnik 2 followed less than a month later, on November 3rd. Sputnik 2 was more complex than Sputnik 1 in that it was designed to carry the first living creature into space, the dog named Laika. The time it took to engineer Sputnik 2 was achieved in a little less than three weeks. Laika holds the honor of being the first animal launched into space, although she unfortunately did not survive the trip. This was another major victory for Korolev. Not wanting to lose momentum, he told Khrushchev he could launch another satellite in time for the anniversary of the Great October Revolution. Object D was completed and launched on April 27, 1958. By this point, by the way, the Americans had launched three satellites of their own, 
In response, Sputnik 3 had stepped up the competition by having more scientific equipment than any other satellite up until then. Korolev's early successes put him in the favor of Khrushchev. Their personal friendship allowed Korolev to bypass much of the Soviet bureaucratic tape. Because of this, he was able to begin work on a piloted spacecraft on February 15, 1958. America did not start work on manned spaceflight until August of that same year. The formation of NASA further added weight to Korolev's decisions since the Soviet leadership further saw the need to centralize their own space program. Thus began the development of a manned spacecraft codenamed Project K. Project K would evolve into the Vostok program. Korolev is quoting as saying to Yuri Gagarin, There is an element of risk in the flight tomorrow. Anything can happen, but remember, whatever happens, all our brains will come to your aid. The Soviets put the first man in space largely because they had a several month head start. Korolev did not stop looking ahead even after putting a man in space. He set his eyes on the moon. He started what would end up becoming the Luna program. The Luna program was part of the build up to a potential moon landing. Luna 2 was the first man made object to land on another body in space. More specifically, it was sent to crash into the moon to see what would happen. Luna 3 was the first craft to get a picture of the dark side of the moon, and Luna 9 was the first craft to have a soft landing on a body in the solar system. In addition to this, Korolev also starred the Venera and Mars programs. Venera managed to land a probe on another planet for the first time. That planet was Venus. All was good until 1966, when Korolev died due to complications to what should have been a routine surgery. His death was massively damaging to the Soviet space program. Luna 9 was launched only about two weeks after his death. The pace of Soviet innovation slowed after Korolev's death. Not only did they no longer have his vision, but also future leaders of the space program would have to deal with the issue he never had to. Korolev's early successes in political acumen allowed him to work within the Soviet system to a degree that his successors failed to replicate. The lack of authority his successors had put them in a tough situation, where they had to succeed or risk being ousted by Soviet leadership. Without friends in high places, Korolev's replacement, Mission, needed a win. Unfortunately, a string of failures involving the N-1 program left Mission in a bad spot. The N-1 program was the one developing a rocket to potentially send cosmonauts to the moon. Later on, Mission greenlit the launch of Soyuz 1. Soyuz 1 holds the dubious honor of being the first in-flight fatality in human spaceflight. The brave cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov went up. Unfortunately, on the descent back down from space, the parachute on his craft failed to deploy, and he hit the ground at terminal velocity. The effects of this disaster were noticeable. The closest comparison to this disaster I can think of is the Challenger disaster that happened later. Both were tragedies caused by higher ups in a space agency ignoring the worries of engineers to meet deadlines. In addition, both were so catastrophic to the program that they grounded their respective vehicle for two years or more. The Soyuz disaster paused all manned Soviet space flights for 18 months. By the time it was already late 1968, and as we know now, 1969 was the year that the Americans landed on the moon. The Soviets would have barely had a year, if that, to pull together some kind of moon program. But to make matters worse, the N1 program I mentioned earlier was still stuck. There had been repeated failures, and at this point they were thinking of scrapping the program completely. It can't be said for certain that if Korolev had lived longer that things would have turned out differently. But the data does show Korolev had both the skill and political authority needed to run the space program to its fullest. He had enough authority to afford repeated testing failures in order to make sure that the actual mission would not fail. His most stressful moments were those when human life was on the line. He openly wept when he thought that the Vostok 2 mission had failed. It could safely be said at a minimum he would not have launched Soyuz 1 knowing the issues it had. It's hard to say if the development of the N1 rocket would have gone better if Korolev had lived, but his ability to efficiently pull together different teams within the Soviet space program certainly made him more efficient than future leaders. The Soviet space program was made up of several competing teams, all vying for funding. Korolev somehow managed to get them all in line in working towards the same general goal. He inspired respect among his workers and was truly a master at managing. Korolev was a unique combination of a politician, planner, manager, and engineer. The Soviets' greatest disadvantage in the space race in a way was Korolev. He was so good at his job and at leading the space program that no one had even thought of what to do if for some reason he wasn't there. So his death was in essence the destruction of one of the foundational elements of the Soviet space program, and arguably it never truly recovered. Most of the space race was characterized by the Americans playing catch up to the Soviets. For every successful Soviet missions, America would launch three to compensate, most of which exploded in some way, shape, or form. Korolev's death slowed the Soviets down significantly. It slowed them down so much that the Americans not only caught up to them, but started to pull ahead. 
The Soviets still had some wins after his death. The first space station was certainly an accomplishment, but their successes slowly became fewer and farther between.